We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that we really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovics. Joining me today is Frank Justra, CEO of Fiore Group and Philanthropist. Thanks for joining me today, Frank. Thanks, Tom. Nice to be on. Excellent to have you. So you wrote uh, a couple of papers from a macro view in 2001, making the case for gold and saying that you were very comfortable at the time making that call. So could you compare that time uh, for us to to right now and, and where your comfort, comfort level is at in the gold space? Well, that's a good question. So back in 2001, you have to remember gold was $250 an ounce. Uh, it was completely out of favor. Almost it feels like almost gold today <laughs> when everybody's saying poo-pooing gold and talking about cryptocurrencies. But um, what had happened was that I, I'm i a student of economic history. I love history and I've studied history. And, and I started to see some patterns develop in the late 90s. And by 2001, I was very confident that uh, the U.S. dollar was going down and gold was going to go up. And so I did my research based on that. And I published my first paper in 2001. And I've been publishing papers ever since. And the, the catalyst behind my views was Fed behavior, how the Fed behaved, how it started to change its behavior prior to 2001 in the late 90s. And basically what they were doing was coming, you know, it was Alan Greenspan at the time running the Fed. And he was coming to the rescue at every financial crisis, you know, and, and using interest rates at that time to make money cheap and allow liquidity to come back into the system. Um, and, I, and, and I started to see a change in moral hazard, like the moral hazard was starting to set in. And by the time 9-11 hit in 2001, it was all, it, the system had already been primed and then it went into overgear. And what happened was that that's when the Fed truly lost its independence with the administration. So fiscal and monetary policy sort of worked in tandem from there on in. And, and, and it's gotten much worse uh, as, as time goes on. And so what happened was they, they lowered rates to zero, um, and which allowed the government to borrow heavily. And so what did the government do? It not only borrowed heavily, it engaged on some, some very costly wars, you know, Afghanistan and Iraq, which cost trillions of dollars over the years, and lowered taxes and uh, encouraged the public to consume. And to me, that just set the stage. And it really, and I really started writing a lot more about it around 2005 when I started to see that things were getting crazy, money was too cheap, and there was too much speculation, too much debt, and then along came the, um, the crisis in 2008. And you know, which was very predictable. You had a bubble happening in, in the housing market with all these mortgage-backed securities and all the things that were going on. And, and basically, at that point, I realized that lowering rates to zero wasn't going to be enough. That you just, you know, the, the, the crisis was far too big. So what did they do, which was also very predictable, and I predicted it was, they started printing money. And that's when... Um, there was no going back, in my opinion. And I know that uh, starting in 2009, started to print a lot of money. They kept rates artificially low forever. And all that managed to do was to create more borrowing. So what happens? From 2008 to today, debt, global debt has doubled. Global debt stands at $270 trillion. And I kept saying back then, even when Bernanke, when he was Fed chair, and he kept reassuring the markets that they were going to normalize rates and unwind the balance sheet, I called BS. And I said, you can't do that. Um, it, you'll implode the whole economy. The government won't be able to service the, the, the debt, which at that time, I mean, you compare the debt. I, I, we were worried about the debt back then. Look at it today. What is it? About $25 trillion of federal debt. Um, you can't service that date of debt with normalized interest rates. It's impossible. So we're in a forever zero rate interest environment. That's the environment we're in. And where money printing will continue forever until something happens that will dramatically change things. I think 
There has to be a complete restructuring of the of the global monetary system. All sorts of things are going to have to happen. But we're in this they're in this vicious cycle now that they can't get out of. And so, what does that mean for gold? Well, in two thousand one, I said well, gold's going to go up. Two two thousand and eight, I said gold's going to go up. And you have, now we're in the third phase. So the first phase was two thousand one, two thousand and eight. Second phase started then the gold market phase. And now we about two years ago the third phase started. And we're in the third phase, which, and I think this will be the one that really takes gold a lot higher as soon as one thing happens, inflation kicks in. And we'll talk about that if you like. Um, so, yes, am I comfortable with my gold position? Absolutely. Because it, gold, historically, and it's never failed, works really well in periods of high inflation, in periods when currencies are being devalued, and in periods where equity markets take a sharp, sharp downturn. That's when you want to own gold. So that's why you have it as a hedge in your portfolio. No matter what else you're doing out there, you can be buying stocks, you can be buying cryptocurrencies, do whatever you like, you know, you're taking risks, but gold is your store of value and your safe haven asset. So my gold position has remained, even in all of this craziness that's happening at the moment, my attitude has not changed. Um, I have my gold position and I will keep it. I'm up, you know, five times from 2001, and I think it's going to go a lot higher at some point. Frank, you you also recently wrote an article entitled "The U.S. Dollar: The Final Act," and as part of it, you stated that the average lifespan of reserve assets is around 100 years. So, in your view, has the pandemic really driven the final nail into the coffin of the dollar? Yeah, I uh, I don't know if it was the pandemic. It certainly has been. I think the pandemic is just one more excuse for the printing of money. Um, we're now talking, we used to talk in, in, in the context of billions and billions of dollars. Now we're talking in the context of trillions and trillions. Every time that Biden opens his mouth, you know, $2 trillion comes spewing out. I and mean, he's just, it's $2 trillion here and $2 trillion there and $2 trillion. I mean, it's all fine and well, but taxes, you know, he can't raise taxes to raise that kind of money. It's just not going to happen. So where does that money come from? It comes by issuing debt. How is that debt dealt with? when interest rates are at zero and bonds yield nothing. So who buys that debt? Well, the Fed does. So they monetize the debt and that creates a very vicious cycle. It's gonna be a big squeeze coming here as Ray Dalio puts it. And um, we're in a situation where the dollar is, its days are numbers. That's a, that is a mathematical certainty. It's a question of when, how long can it hang on? Um, and that, you know, it could go a lot further, but my, these days are numbered as the reserve currency, okay? Now, we don't know what will replace it at this stage. It could be a combination of things. It could be a fragmentation of the global monetary system, but something's going to, the dollars, day, the days of the dollar as a supreme reserve currency, those, you just can't print endless amounts of money forever and expect that money to have the same value. It just, it's, it's not, it's impossible. Frank, you, you're bringing up the fact that the Fed is printing trillions and trillions of dollars. And, and one of the consequences of this has been the inflation of all of these asset bubbles and not necessarily an appreciable increase in CPI. So what has caused this shift in CPI starting to rise as we've seen um, since, let's say, New Year's here. And is this trend likely to continue as we see countries starting to reopen and economic activity start to try and return to normal? Well, you're right. The CPI, you're just starting to see it now. The last, so when they printed all that money back in 2008, and, you know, for the next few years, all of that inflation went into assets, as you said, you know, mostly the stock market, the bond market, uh, some real estate, but basically it was an asset inflation. This time around, you're seeing it across the board, and you're seeing it in all commodities from lumber, which is up 340% in one year, to steel, which is up 20% this year. All food, commodities, grains, livestock, everything is up sharply. So that's going to work its way into consumer costs, housing costs, food bills. All of that's going to, you're already seeing it, but it's really going to start to kick in, in my view, in the next few quarters. And we haven't seen that kind of inflation since the 1970s, okay? The sort of inflation you're going to start to see this year and going into next year will be very high inflation, and that's going to be the catalyst 
it really puts the fire under gold. As we're as we're speaking of bubbles, Frank, every time we see the equity markets take a bit of a dip, we're repeated the same line that there's plenty of liquidity ready to come into the markets from households, the rich institutions, and and drive prices back up and buy the dip. Uh, you pointed out a recent article, um, recent Market Watch article to me, stating that there is fifty cents sitting on the sidelines for every dollar held in stocks. What are your thoughts on this? I don't think that you can count on that. I would, I'd be very careful about counting on that liquidity sitting on the sidelines that will um, protect the market in a dip. Now, yes, in a, in a normal day-to-day -day market correction, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's always money on the sidelines and people have been conditioned to buy on dips now for over 20 years. I mean, that, that whole mantra, buy on dips, everybody's conditioned to do that. So that's fine. But when you get a real, when you have a bubble in the markets, like we're seeing today, you know, the equity markets are way overvalued by all metrics. You know, they're just overvalued, and you can't argue that. Uh, the bond market is really overvalued. <laughs> uh, that's the scariest market of all is the bond market. So, what happens when you get a an event that creates a very sharp market correction, like we had in 2020 with COVID? Okay, every bubble. And bubbles, listen, can, can go up for a long, long time. This bubble could go a lot further, but they're all begging to be pricked. And there's always a pin out there just waiting to be that catalyst. So it'll be some event. I don't know what that event will be, and I don't know when it's going to be, but it, it happens, and that's when the markets will go for a tumble because everyone's levered up to the hill. So you have all of this debt out there supporting these assets, whether it's equities, bonds, cryptocurrencies. And so when something happens, a geopolitical event, a financial crisis, something, you know, there's going to be some accident out there that will be the excuse for the market to go for a real tumble. And the other thing we've all been conditioned to is that the Fed comes to the rescue. And again, for over 20 years now, the Fed comes, you know, you have a market correction, of a severe market correction for some reason, whatever. And, you know, Wall Street starts to, you know, scream up and down and the Fed comes to the rescue and they save the market. But one of these days, you can only play that game for so long when you're printing trillions and trillions of dollars. One of these times, maybe the next time, there's a very severe market correction and the Fed will predictably come to the rescue. It might have lost its efficacy. And then nothing happens and people go, oh my God, it didn't. It doesn't help because you, <laughs> you just saturated the market with, with with free money, and it, it just it, it doesn't have the same effect. And that's what I'm, I'm afraid is going to happen here. So I think that these equity markets, you know, they may go a little, a little bit further, um, but I, I think they're really, really overvalued. What really worries me is all this craziness in the cryptocurrency space. I mean, that's just insanity what's going on out there. Look at this Dogecoin. It was $87 billion market cap today. You, just to put it into context, if you take the market caps of Kellogg's, Campbell Soup, Domino's Pizza, Dunkin' Don Donuts, and Beyond Meat combined, <laughs> it still doesn't reach $87 billion. Now, I don't know what Dogecoin does, but I know you can't eat it. It's something that is just there for speculation. And that's, you know what? And I, and I get all of the heat on, on social media that I'm, you know, I'm a dinosaur, I don't get it, you know. I'm a boomer and all these things. And this time it's different. But guess what? It's They've been saying this time it's different every single bubble throughout history. And there is actually a book called This Time It's Different that you should read, written by two economists, Rogoff and somebody else. And um, and they go through the last, past 800 years of bubbles. And they every time people say, no, no, but this time it's, I mean, it's not the same as... The, now, I went through the dot-com bubble and and I remember not getting, not understanding. I was like scratch reading these analyst reports on these tech companies, these dot com. I was going, I, I don't get it. And, 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 and people would yell at me saying, "You just don't get. You're a dinosaur. You don't get it." And I'm going, "Well, maybe I guess I am." But you know, again, all of these st stupid prices on when people speculate that the level they're speculating today, and people are encouraging that type of behavior. And they're telling people to lever up, to go out and borrow and buy cryptocurrencies. 
that's going to end very, very badly. And I suspect that, um, I don't know how long it's going to go, but at some point, a lot of people are going to get hurt. Mm -hmm. So so something, Frank, that that I'd like to get your thoughts on, you know, exactly as you're pointing out, there's an unprecedented level of speculation right now. And looking at things over different timelines, something that Michael Saylor brought up in in your guys' gold versus Bitcoin debate was that if over the last eight months, if he would have put... um, invested in gold versus Bitcoin, he would have lost $4 billion. So yeah. can can I get your thoughts towards, you know, really evaluating things over over a proper timeline? Yeah, because like I said to him, garbage in, garbage out. If you, you know, if I take any, if I take a one-year time frame for Bitcoin going back a couple of years, I can show much worse performance than gold. If I, now, as I said to him, if I take, uh, periods of time in gold, like, like take the 1970s, I was mentioning earlier, the last time we had a period of high inflation, gold went up by 25 times between 1971 and 1980, 25 times. Um, so I could say to people, yeah, you got to buy gold because it, you know, or I, just in the last four years, gold's gone up 70%. Okay. So pick your time frames. you know, sure. Bitcoin's had a hell of a run the last couple of years and Michael Saylor can make all those claims, but that's not the purpose of gold. If you want to speculate on Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency or anything for that matter, go ahead. But just understand that you're speculating. You're, you're, you're betting on something that's very risky that could also go down 80% when you wake up one morning, okay, as Bitcoin has done. So I, you know, if I wanted to buy Bitcoin, I'd do it to, for a trade, yeah, and, you know, obviously risk a little bit of money, so in, an amount of money that I was willing to lose. But gold is a core it's a centerpiece of your portfolio because it protects you against everything else that may go wrong. And so if I'm expecting high inflation, like I am, if I'm expecting the devaluation of the US dollar, which I am in due course, and I'm also expecting at some point a severe market correction because everything's so grossly overvalued, I want to own gold. And that is my gold portion of my portfolio. Now pick a number. Is that 5%? Is that 10%? Is that 15%? Is that 20% of your portfolio? Everybody has a different risk tolerance. And then the rest of your money is in other things. And I always tell people diversify. The dumbest thing you can do is what people like Michael Saylor are doing is telling people sell everything and put everything into Bitcoin. That is about the dumbest advice I've ever heard. And, and, And some people are going to get really hurt following that kind of advice. And it's really tragic. It will happen. I don't know how long it'll take, but it's going to happen. Frank, while while we're on that subject, can you talk a little bit about the the dynamics of what has driven the Bitcoin price while gold didn't perform over that same period? And is that mostly due to that speculative speculative nature of of Bitcoin? Yeah, I just think that there are some very um, there there there's a cadre of people out there that are uh, that are getting a lot of social media play. Michael Saylor is one of them. There's several of them, um, and they are appealing, in my opinion, to the greed factor um, because the way they sell it is not on value but on price. So they're, it's all about price. And that to me, you know, that, that game ends at some point. And they're making predictions of $100,000 Bitcoin, half a million dollar Bitcoin, $1 million Bitcoin. And I've heard Michael Saylor even go up to $5 million of Bitcoin on these interviews. And to me, that's lunacy, but what it does, it, it appeals to the greed factor. And then you've got all the hedge funds coming in who love momentum. You know, the hedge funds aren't long-term investors, but they, Bitcoin is giving them momentum and speed. So they're moving the price up and it's all wonderful. And a lot of people are making money. And, and I say, God bless them all. And then, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I think that's great, but it is being driven in my opinion by greed factors, not by fundamentals. And so that's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing a cult-like behavior in the way that people certain, and I'm not sure, you can't say this for all cryptocurrency investors, but certainly a lot of them are exhibiting cult-like behavior in the way that you can't even criticize them. You know, they they, they lash out at you. They, they, you know, they call you all sorts of names. They, you know, they, it's, it's really, some of the stuff I get thrown at me on social media is crazy. Um, but it, to me, that's that's that sort of behavior is not. That's not the way an investor should think about his portfolio. That is, to me, that's cult-like, and it's 
mania. It feels to me, it feels like a mania. And like I said before, manias can go very, very far. You know, you know, Bitcoin can go a lot higher. I, I fully accept that. But you better understand why you're buying something. I, I think most Bitcoin people don't truly understand why they're buying it. They're just buying it because it sounds good. It sounds revolutionary. It sounds, God, we're getting away from this. De- we're, this is our escape from a centralized system into something that's decentralized that they can, the governments cannot interfere with and all of these things. And, you know, I have my own concerns, you know, and I, again, you should watch the debate. Um, I pointed out the risks that exist and the real risks that no one, none of the Bitcoin promoters are willing to acknowledge. And I think that that, you know, go ahead and buy something, but understand why you're buying it and understand the risk. And once you understand the risk, then go knock yourself out. <laughs> but as I said, again, you should buy some gold as a hedge. You know, buy, buy all the Bitcoin and have fun and hopefully you'll make a lot of money. But if things go the wrong way for you, you should own some gold. <laughs> Frank, I think one of the one of those really important points that you've brought up and, and something that I really appreciate about your position is that you're saying that you should be diversified and not only sell everything you have and pile into one thing. So you've said before that, let's say, take 10% and, and put it into, into gold. What does the other 90% of your portfolio or, or let's say a portfolio for today's day and age, what should that consist of to you? And, and here's the problem. I get asked this a lot. And the problem is I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not certain, like mo- no one has a crystal ball and we're living in an era now that is unprecedented in global history. This is a global phenomenon for the first time where you have this amount of global debt, all the central banks are printing money and which is mispriced, it was, which is mispricing many asset classes. So what is real anymore? What it, where does value truly exist? And it's hard. So what do I say to people? I say, if it were me, I would stay away from bonds. I think bonds are going to get absolutely hammered with inflation because you're, they're already yielding nothing. And then inflation is going to make the nominal value go poof. So stay away from bonds. The stock market, I, I think, is always a question of time. And I just think that the stock market is grossly overvalued right now, but at some point it will correct and maybe there will be, a, and, and you have to pick stocks. You can't just buy the broad market. Um, so you have to be, you know, that, that, that's a very difficult job. So I, so, okay. So stocks are overpriced. So you have to wait cash. Cash is good, except when you have high inflation and cause you always need cash in case there is a stock market correction and you want to take advantage of that. That's why I would rather own gold than cash, so that if there is a stock market correction, gold usually goes up. When, when, once all the dust settles, gold goes up. The market needs, you know, needs to kind of find its bottom, and then you can use your gold to buy some stocks, uh, sell some gold, buy stocks. But um, so, but a little bit of cash, but not too much. Real estate. So I, I would say skew your portfolio towards hard assets because that's where the action is going to be. So metals, commodities, companies, uh, anything that's commodity driven is going to do well. And, uh, and I think for quite a period of time. So uh, real estate, of course, and, um, you know, depending on the size of your portfolio, I mean, you can buy fine art, but, you know, that's, you know, that takes real money. So you have to, you know, most people can't afford fine art. So um, that's, that's how I would say it. But it's, it's difficult. I'm telling you, I, this is truly unprecedented. And I don't think anybody truly knows what's going to happen. That's why diversification is absolutely important because one thing goes wrong, at least you're saved by the other. So when, when you're looking at, at gold miners to invest in, Frank, what types of, of plays or, or things are, are most important to you? Are you looking at only management teams? Are you looking at jurisdictions? What do you look at when you're looking at um, gold miners to invest in? Well, as you might know, I create gold mining companies. That's, you know, I dabble in so many things. Like I've, I've been invested in movies and food and this and that. Um, but what I'm really good as at is creating gold mining companies. And I've been doing it for 20 years now. Um, I've built, I have a successful model 
that I've deployed three times already in the last 20 years. I'm now building my fourth gold mining company. And let me tell you how it's done. Um, and it's because of the strategy that I deploy, it's all about management. Okay. It is mostly about management. And then obviously it's about the assets, but without the management, you cannot execute what I'm about to describe to you. So it started back in 2001 when we created Wheaton River. I did that with Ian Telfer and which became Gold Corp, which is at one time was the third largest gold mining company in the world. And that was part of Newmont. Um, but we started it as an idea. It was based on my gold thesis at the time. I went out, talked about my gold thesis, and then we decided to, since we believed that gold was going up, we might as well build a gold mining company. I'd been an investment banker, ran an investment banking firm in the 80s and the 90s, and so uh, and we specialized in mining finance. That was our whole thing. And so uh, I had the skill set, and I had the connections, and I put together a team of people. And what we did, we always started with a single asset, so we bought a mine. And then we deployed a buy and build strategy. So using M&A, and this is where capital markets expertise is absolutely essential. Um, and so we slowly acquired other mines, built, developed and built other mines. And usually this process takes two to five years, okay? Before you, we have what we deem to be an important mining company, which is something that produces over a million ounces of gold a year. That's an intermediate gold producer. Um, and that's where you get the re-rating in the stock. Uh, you get a higher multiple and that's what we did. So we did it with Gold Corp and that was from 2001 to whenever. Uh, and then in 2009, I started my second one, which was Endeavor Mining. And again, I started it by raising $100 million of uh, blind pool money. And we went out and decided to build a gold mining company based in West Africa. Same thing. We bought one mine. We started with one mine. And then by the time it was done, we had five mines in West Africa. Endeavor is now the largest producer in West Africa. It operates in many countries. It's like a $4 billion market cap. Um, and so that worked out very well for us. Then in 2016, I took the same management because that, uh, Endeavor had – we changed control. A, a new group came in and took control of the company. We exited, and we've done very well. We exited. We decided. I went back to Neil Woodyear. I said, "Let's do it again." Let's. But this time, I said, "Let's do it in Latin America," because I believe there are a lot of opportunities in Latin America. I've been going there for 35 years, and so we created Lea Gold, and we bought a mine in Mexico, then bought several mines in Brazil, and again we built it up, and we did a two billion dollar merger with Equinox, and now. Leia Gold is part of Equinox, which is a multi-mine company uh, run by Ross Beatty, who's an amazing, amazing uh, mining executive. Um, so, and I still own Equinox. I'm, you know, I, I'm a happy shareholder. Um, and then um, last year, we decided to do it again. I said, to Neil, let's do it again, because this gold market is just beginning. We have the skill set. We've got the context. So we created Eris Mining. And Eris operates in Colombia. And basically, I put together a team, which included Neil Woodyear, Ian Telfer from Gold Corp, Peter Moroni from Yamana, David Graflo, who is the uh, CEO of Gold Corp, uh, Serafina Yakino, who's uh, the CEO of uh, Grand Colombia. And we decided to put this team together. We have one mining operation in Colombia, the Marmato Mine, which is going through an expansion now, fully funded. Uh, which will produce it'll produce about 200,000 ounces a year for about 13 years just on its reserves, which are about 2 million ounces. But we have measured, indicated, and, in, and, and, and inferred of another 6 million ounces. This will be a mine that will last a long time. So that's our starting mine. So Eris, which I put in a lot, I think I put in about 20 million into Eris. And the group, we raised privately 85 million from just our group. And we're going to build that into another over the next two to four years, we'll build it into another intermediate gold producer. Right? Again, our goals get over a million ounces a year very quickly. We know how to do it. It's mostly our m and expertise that, that comes to play, but we also know how to build mines. And so Eris is my new deal, and uh, I'm very heavily invested in it. Uh, I'm not on the board, but I'm their special advisor. Uh, and, um, yeah, it's fully the, the mine expansion, the construction from Armado is fully funded. 
couple hundred million dollars. And yeah, so that's that's how we do it. It's a formula that works. But yet, and again, I'll go back to the importance of the management team. We know how to do this. There aren't a lot of groups like ours that have done this time and time again. And it is not easy. There are very difficult moments or very challenging moments, or very dramatic moments. It doesn't always go well. But, uh, you know, the stock, which is probably trading, I don't know where it's trading around, two and a quarter, two and a half. Um, I'm going to hold that until we achieve our goal. And I'm very patient. I always wait. And, and the rewards are always there. We haven't failed yet. There's no reason we're going to fail this time. It's how we do it. It's, pro it's a proven formula. So that's, 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 that's how I do it. Frank, as you have this this perspective, this long term, let's say twenty plus year experience perspective, um, how have things changed on the ESG regulation front um, since you started in this business, and and how are the how is that going to impact business going forward? Well, I think it's I, first of all, I, I have to tell you, I think it's a good thing. Uh, I think that this ESG movement, and it's not so much about the regulations. I think it's more about investors are demand, especially the institutional investors, are demanding that ESG is incorporated into, into businesses, including mining. And, um, and I, I think it's a change in mindset that is here to stay. And I think it's great because I'm, I'm a great believer that we are slowly destroying this planet and, and, and you know, deforestation, all the things that are going on are, we're destroying this planet. It's the only one we have. We can't ship everybody to Mars. It's not gonna happen. You know, I, I believe that climate change caused by CO2 emissions is real. I, I believe that. And that is, and it's going to kill us all if we don't get it under control. I believe that inequality is out of control and that, um, you know, uh, you've got, and it's going to cause political upheaval and chaos and political instability. Um, all these things that need to be addressed. And I think that governments don't have the kind of resources that they used to have to deal with. A lot of that ability has shifted to the corporate sector. So companies have to take this on. And, and, and you know what? And in a lot of ways, it's profitable. If you look at what's going on with the electric vehicle revolution, which I think is a great thing. I mean, look what that's doing for certain metals, you know, nickel, copper, uh, silver, uh, you know, cobalt. Uh, it's, it, 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 you know, to, to create the electric vehicle batteries, you're going to need all these metals. So um, I think that that you know, it's, it's, it's a great thing. And I think that it is uh, certainly the newer generation, you know, they blame the boomers for creating this mess. And, and, you know, I don't want my kids to be mad at me. I, you know, my, my daughter says to me, keeps pounding on, me, you know, daddy, you got to help save the planet. And, uh, you know, and I think, so I think it's a good thing that, uh, that, that it's becoming part of what business corporate culture should be all about. Frank, something that uh, I think you have, again, the, the, great perspective of is, is looking at things from a from a real macro view. You said that we're very early in this gold cycle. And something I'd like to get your thoughts towards is, is what kind of indicators are going to signal the, that to you that it's time to start selling some of your positions and, and to start to exit. It's been said that you know, it's 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 the easy part of the equation to buy equities or, or gold equities. When when do you think um, are going to or, or what kind of factors are going to present themselves to you that are going to say it's time to start thinking about getting out of some of these positions? Well, the, the gold mining sector is like any other sector, and I would treat it in the same way. If I, if, if I am right about what's going to happen with gold as soon as inflation kicks in here, um, that's going to take the gold mining stocks with it. And at some point in that cycle, there's going to be a lot of froth and a lot of reckless behavior and you will you, you'll be able to see it just like you can see it in other things today and I or as, as I've seen in things in the past you know when things get frothy when everybody thinks it's so easy to make money in a specific sector that's when you should sell and we're not we're not we're not there yet on, on gold mining stocks far from it so um yeah that's and I've seen that before in the past I I saw it, I got in the business back in the late 70s so I watched that the gold bull market that started in 71 and really took hold in the last few years of the 70s and took it to $800 an ounce back then. And it was insanity and the behavior was reckless and everything was going up. You could you could do no wrong, just throw a dart and you do, you do well. Um, it happened again in, 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 the, in the last decade. There was, you know, there was a lot of froth 
that when gold went up, you know, up to around 2011 and things got crazy, and you took the opportunity to sell. You got to wait, you know, you gotta, again, you have to be patient, but you can always see the signals when you should sell something. It, it should be obvious. And I think this is the part where experience being older is very beneficial because you've seen it all before. <laughs> you go, okay, I can smell what's going on here. It's, it, it's time to sell. Frank, I'd like to I'd like to turn a little bit to more of your mindset. You wrote a, a five part series on your blog called "The Five Secrets to a Balanced Life," and in it, you say through trial and error, you've developed a pretty good idea of what doesn't work. So, can you share with our audience a little bit more about your thoughts on the subject of living a balanced life, please? Yeah, so it was a five part series, and it just I basically looked at the way I'd lived my life and the lessons I'd learned, the mistakes that I'd made, and what was important. Uh, and what gave me peace? I think we're all, all of us are looking to, for some form of peace. You know, we're all looking for happiness, but you can't be happy all the time. So the best you can hope for is that you find a peaceful existence. And the way I define that is that when you're on your deathbed, you should have no regrets. And you know, when I've sat by certain people that were dying and I've heard regrets, and I don't want to be that person. And so for me, it was, so how do you find your peace? And, and, and by the way, my my approach is not going to be the same as somebody else's. And so I, I can only speak to mine. And mine was, what what are the things in my life that create balance and therefore give me peace? So it was uh, basically family and friends right up there. You know, spend lots of time with family and friends. Celebrate life with them. You know, don't work so hard that you don't have the chance to celebrate with your family and friends. And I do a lot of that. I do a lot of, I love to cook. So I throw these big dinner parties and invite family, friends, and it's, it's my form of joy. Um, always be learning. Learn new things. Never stop learning. I'm, the, I'm very curious. I, I take up new subjects and I, get, I, I dive into something. And I want to learn it and I want to do it. And, I, you know, and it's, whether it's music, which you know, I've got a music studio, or whether it's studying quantum physics, you know, whatever it is, but be learning something. Because that keeps your mind sharp. It, it makes you, it makes you more interesting than all you. If you're super smart in just business, you're the most boring dinner guest party you can have. I've had people over that all they want to do is talk about business. It's dull. So always learn new things. Um, uh, philanthropy. So have a purpose. Mine is philanthropy. Yours might be something different. So mine is that I decided a very long time ago that I was going to give away my money. And I was going to do it in ways that were effective, that were sustainable, and that helped as many people as humanly possible. So I'm involved in everything from poverty alleviation in Latin America and the Caribbean, my refugee work around the world, uh, conflict resolution on the co-chair of the International Crisis Group, which tries to uh, prevent and end deadly conflicts. I do a lot of things at home. I do the Million Gardens Movement, which is about educating the American public on food um, and the importance of growing your own food. So I'm, I've got a lot of things. That's 80% of my life is philanthropy. So that's my purpose. Somebody else's might be something different. Um, trying to think the other, uh, the other two, uh, adventure. <laughs> I, you know, I like to get my heart rate going. So I like to do adventures, things that are a little bit, you know, scary. And it's nice to be scared. It keeps you, makes you feel alive to, so, you know, from, race car driving to mountain climbing to, you know, whatever, parachuting. Um, it's just always look for an adventure, you know, because that really does make you feel young. Uh, I think that's four. And I, there's a fifth. I remember what the fifth one was. Um, I can't remember the fifth one. You look it up. Go to frankjustra.com and look up the, uh, uh, five, the five ways to balance your life, whatever it's called. Five, you know, five secrets to a balanced life. Exactly. That's I wrote that two, two, three years ago. Yeah, it's an excellent read. Yeah. Um, Frank, you also have a section on your website that's called Books You're Reading. So what are you reading at the moment and, and what are some of your all-time favorites? Uh, I just finished a book report. I haven't started any. I just finished a book last week and I wrote, I just published my report on it yesterday uh, on, my, on, my, on my blog site, which was uh, about Howard Buffett, Warren Buffett's son. And it's called 40 Chances on how he went about to try and alleviate uh, food insecurity around the world. And it's an excellent book if you're into that sort of stuff like I am. Uh, but, you know, 
I read a lot about quantum physics <laughs> and about uh, you know uh, astrophysics and uh, and I and it's to me it's fascinating. There's a great book uh, written by a friend of mine, Brian Green, who's one a great physicist, uh, and he wrote a book called The Fabric of the Cosmos. And if you have any interest in physics, and I'm telling you, people, I because I was the same way in high school, but physics. I don't even want to take physics. It sounds really dull. Um, I'd rather take chemistry and blow up stuff, but Physics is fascinating, especially quantum physics. Um, and when you get into it, as I have over the last 15 years, it just, I, I kind of went down this rabbit hole. So Fabric of the Cosmos, great, great book. Uh, I think as a way to live your life, because I, I read a lot about how to live a good life, The Four Agreements. I don't know if you've ever read that. It's a very easy book to read. You could read it in one day. Uh, and it really changed my life. And I've given it as gifts to many, 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 many people, including the kids that I mentor. I'm part of the, the Boys, Boys Club Network in, in Vancouver, and which I've been doing for you know, 23 years. And I always recommend that book to those kids. And it's you know, four very simple rules, how to live your life. Read that book. Honestly, I won't get into it now, but it's, it's an amazing book about how to live your life. I'm trying to think, I've written so many books. Um, I've read so many books. Uh, I can't recall, but go to my blog. There's a whole section on all the books that I read. I haven't started a new book yet, but I'm looking around my bookshelf right now. Absolutely, and your your website is is full of great uh, great information. You re, uh, write a lot of articles. There's all of your book reports there. Um, that's all available at frankjustra.com. Frank, is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience? Anything that's on your mind right now? I just, I just think, yeah, I think one thing you should keep in mind is because <clears throat> I think it's an important indicator and in that we uh, watch real interest rates going forward here as we come into this period of inflation, which is starting. You're starting to see it now in the CPI. By the CPI has been managed to underestimate inflation for many, many years, and they, they tinker with it a lot. But they're not going to be able, even the best government statistician is not going to be able to mask what's happening with real inflation where it hits, you know, the consumer's pocketbook. So watch real interest rates because what's going to happen here, here's the interesting dynamic. Inflation is going to start to kick in, pretty high inflation as I see. But rates are not going to be able to catch up so you, because they can't allow rates to go any higher. It will implode the markets will implode the entire economy, and it will implode uh, the government because the, you know the twenty-five trillion dollars of debt. You normalize rates, you can't service that debt anymore. They know they're in a box now, and they can talk all about, and that's all they do. They they raise rates a bit, and then they talk a lot about how they're going to raise rates, and they never do because they can't. They're in a box. So yields can only go up so high, and they will be managed down by the Fed, and. Inflation is going to go up, so you're going to get um, uh, you're going to get negative interest rates, okay, real real interest rates, and when that happens, that's when gold is going to really kick kick kick, kick off. And if it's anything like the 1970s, it's going to go a lot higher. Excellent, Frank. That's uh, you know some some sound advice that was um, reiterated last week when I spoke with with Lynn Alden as well. Um, Frank, thanks so very much for your time today. We really appreciate it. My pleasure, Tom. Thank you very much. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.